Hello, I'm the British Poro. Welcome to my complete guide to drafting in League of Legends. Everybody that plays League of Legends goes through draft pick every single day, often without paying much notice to it. It's just the way we select our champions before we get into game, right? Well, that's pretty much true for solo queue, but once you look through the lens of competitive 5 vs 5 gameplay, be it amateur, collegiate, or pro, there's so much to consider. By using this 5 minute phase of the game effectively, you can ensure yourself an advantage in the game, and today I'm going to attempt to show you what to consider in each section of the draft phase, so that you too can be in an advantage before you even reach the loading screen. Drafting is, in itself, a form of game. It's a strategy game with its own set of rules. Most people that play League are familiar with these rules, but for those of you that aren't, or would just like a refresher, they are as follows. Each team begins by banning three champions they don't want to see in the draft. This removes them from the pool of pickable champions. The teams alternate banning one champion at a time until they've banned three champions each. Blue side gets the first ban, and this is known as the first round of bans. After the first round of bans, we get the first round of picks. Blue side get the first pick of the draft, and after blue side select one champion, red side select two champions back to back. Then blue side select two champions back to back. Then, red side picks one more champion. At this stage, each team has selected three champions of their five champion team. We now head into the second round of bans. This functions nearly identically to the first round of bans, except for two key differences. Firstly, the teams still take turns banning in this phase, but this time red side gets to ban first. Secondly, each team only bans two champions in the second round, resulting in each team having five total bans. After the second round of bans, we head into the second round of picks. In the second round, red side begins by picking one champion. After this, blue side select two champions, and then red side concludes the draft by picking their final champion. The back and forth nature of the draft order allows a lot of nuance and strategy to be applied to it, but it can be quite complicated to explain exactly which section of the draft we're talking about. For this reason, people that are interested in draft theory have come up with notation to apply to each pick of the draft. Blue side's first pick is known as B1 with B standing for blue and 1 because it's the first pick. After that, we move into R1, meaning red side 1, and R2, meaning red side 2, and then we go back to B2 and B3, and then R3, and so on. This is the style of notation that I'll be using to describe all the picks in this guide. There are a number of things you need to consider before you even start the drafting process. The most important of these is, in my opinion, player comfort. There are over 150 champions in League of Legends, and your players won't be able to play all of them. This should be less of an issue in professional play, but in amateur or collegiate play, it's pretty vital to draft around this. Let's say you're a coach for an amateur team. Ask your players to make you a list of every champion they'd feel comfortable locking in in the finals of whatever tournament or league you're playing in. You'd probably end up with a list looking something like this. Use this list as your bread and butter when deciding which champions to pick. One of the most important aspects of coming out ahead in a draft is getting a thematic edge. This poses the question, what is a theme? Certain champions really like to function in certain ways. Let's take one of the champions from my example supports champion pool, Nautilus. Nautilus loves to engage. His hook allows him to start fights from a distance and his R gives him great single target lockdown. While he can use these spells to attempt to disengage or peel his carries, it's way less reliable than when he's using them to engage. Because of this, Nautilus likes being paired with other champions that like to do what he likes to do. Let's look for something to pair with him in bot lane from the example ADC's champion pool. Kaisa seems like the best option here. She functions best when she's diving into a fight with her R and mopping up kills. She really likes to follow up on engages. These champions fit the same theme, that theme being engage. Disengage, or stand your ground comps, actually want to be engaged on. The goal of these drafts is to start killing an objective, i.e. dragon or baron, and force the enemy team to engage on top of them or risk giving the objective for free. These comps tend to have great tools to make engaging difficult by either straight up denying it or controlling space with heavy damage or terrain creation. Great examples of champions that fit this theme are Zaya and Nivea, Poppy and Lulu. Poke, or high range comps, have carries with much longer range than average, allowing them to chunk the enemy out before cleaning them up. There are two components to these kinds of comps. Firstly, the range element. Iconic champions that fit this theme are Ezreal, Corky, Zoe, and Jace. 
Secondly, some form of cleaning up the mess you've made of the enemy HP bars. Champions like Viego and Kha'Zix thrive in these scenarios. Pick comps want to make the game as messy as possible. These comps like playing with strong side laners that can generate pressure, like Fiora or Jax, then collapsing on them using champions with reliable ways to create a numbers advantage, such as Nocturne, Twisted Fate, or Galio. These comps are often very reliant on building a gold lead early and snowballing, as their 5v5 tends to be quite weak. Generally speaking, disengage counters engage, as it makes the win condition of diving in and starting a fight very difficult. You're playing right into the enemy's hands and have tons of disengage tools to try to navigate around during your engage. On the other hand, poke counters disengage. Disengage comps tend to lack the tools required to reach the higher range vulnerable carries, and so they simply get to poke the disengage comp down for free. On the other hand, because these high range carries are often vulnerable, poke comps tend to be weak against engage comps. Engage comps have plenty of tools to close the gap, and poke comps tend not to be able to function when their enemy is right on top of them. Pick comps sit somewhere in the middle. Their win condition generally comes down to execution, and they're not massively favoured or unfavoured versus any of the other three themes. They tend to be more reliant on individual counters in lanes, allowing them to get priority and move around the map, invade the jungle, deny vision, and make it harder to survive their attempts to pick you off. This is, of course, an extreme oversimplification of thematic advantages, as you can also blend themes together. For example, when two disengage comps meet, generally the one with the higher range carries will be winning, despite both being mainly focused on standing their ground and disengaging. Likewise, when two poke comps meet, the one with the most reliable tools to engage will tend to win. On top of this, there are champions in the game that can single-handedly warp drafts. A great example of this is Sona. While being a disengaged thematic champion, she actually hard counters poke, despite the thematic weakness. Her sustain allows her team to practically ignore the poke coming at them. Identifying what theme the enemy's draft is leaning towards and picking champions that fit the theme they're weak to is one of the key fundamentals of getting yourself ahead in draft, and is one of the main skills that should be practiced and refined when you're looking to get better at drafting. The drafting fundamental that's most commonly understood, while simultaneously misunderstood, is scaling. Generally, League players have a good understanding of how well champions scale in a vacuum. Everyone knows that Kale scales extremely well, and that Renekton or Olaf do not scale particularly well. This is definitely something to consider inside of the draft, but it's important to understand that scaling is relative. So what do I mean by scaling is relative? Well, let's use Aphelios as an example. In isolation, Aphelios scales pretty well. He does a ton of damage when he's allowed to hit single targets with Crescendum, or multiple targets with Infernum. Into engage comps, he scales amazingly, since there's always targets in his face for him to hit. On the other hand, into range-based comps, he doesn't scale very well at all. It doesn't matter how much damage he's capable of doing, because it's so impractical for him to ever actually be able to deal the damage. For this reason, thematic answers often naturally lead to better scaling. Another place we see relative scaling is in individual champion synergies. As previously mentioned, Olaf falls off pretty hard. However, if Olaf is paired with enchanters, particularly Karma or Soraka, he has much better scaling and can actually outscale a lot of other junglers. Another fundamental you should bear in mind is damage spread. You want a healthy spread of physical and magic damage. You'll learn from experience what is and isn't enough of each in different scenarios. This is more important the more reliably the enemy draft can stack resistances. If your draft is heavy on physical damage, for example, the enemy team can be extremely gold efficient with their itemization, making themselves ridiculously tanky by just buying armor items. At times, individual champions demand specific damage spreads. For example, Karthus as a jungler really likes playing with physical damage laners. The enemy laners are forced to itemize armor, making Karthus a massive damage threat. Another extremely important fundamental to understand is flex picks. Flex picks are champions that are able to play multiple roles. For example, right now, Maokai can be played in top, jungle, and support. By picking a flex pick early in the draft, you make it harder for your opponent to answer you, while giving yourself more options later in the draft to find counter picks. The final thing you should try to improve your understanding of before even entering draft is individual champion matchups.
This is most important in the top, mid, and support roles, but sometimes comes into play in ADC and jungle too. There's no easy way to improve this. As a coach, you can ask your players for their perspective on the matchups, but outside of that you either need to be playing them yourself, or watching replays of pros or challenger one tricks playing the matchups. Okay, now that we've talked about what to consider when heading into the draft, let's get into the specifics of the draft process and talk about what you should be thinking about at each stage of the draft. Regardless of whether you're playing blue side or red side, the first consideration and only truly planable aspect of the draft is B1. B1, being the first pick of the draft, dictates the entire path the draft will follow. Different B1 picks call for different responses on R1 and R2, which in turn change B2 and B3, and so on and so forth. For blue side, you should already have an idea of what you're wanting to pick on B1. Let's use Maokai and Caitlyn as some examples. The world champion is midway through right now as I'm recording this, and Maokai and Caitlyn are two of the most contested B1 picks. But what makes these champions good on B1? The main thing you want out of a B1 pick is for it to be very difficult for the enemy to answer. There are two ways that champions can achieve this. Firstly, in the case of Caitlyn, the champion is overtuned and realistically needs to be nerfed. There aren't really any good responses because pretty much everything is losing individual matchups so hard that it just warps the draft. On the other hand, in Maokai's case, the champion's extremely flexible, which leads your opponent to have no clear counters to drafting it. Maokai can play top, he can play jungle, and he can play support extremely well right now. He can also function inside every theme of draft. It's very hard to find an answer to a champion that's this flexible. This line of thinking of having an idea of what you want to pick on B1, or what you think the enemy might want to pick on B1, leads us into the part of the draft that actually happens first. The first round of bans. For red side, this part is really easy. You identify what three B1 picks you'd least like to play against, and you ban those away so that they're no longer an option. For blue side, it's a bit more complicated, but you also have more liberty in what you can ban here. Generally, you want to be covering your B1 with your bans. We've already talked about Maokai, so let's assume we're wanting to pick him on B1. Maokai is extremely vulnerable to Silas. Silas can be picked on R1 as a response and becomes an absolute menace, stealing away the Maokai ultimate for himself. Silas can also play the top lane matchup versus Maokai, so into B1 Maokai, R1 Silas becomes a flex pick as well. This makes Silas a really good blue side ban when you're wanting to B1 Maokai. Alternatively, instead of covering your B1, you can look to target ban from the enemy team, since you don't need to deny specific B1 picks, as you have the first pick as blue side. This is where understanding what champion pools the enemy players have comes into play. If there's a player on the enemy team like Mad Lion's Armut, for example, who performs way better when he gets his chosen champion of Nar, you may want to ban that out to force him off his comfort. Alright, so the first round of bans has happened, and blue side has selected their first pick. The draft now moves into R1, R2. How should red side respond? Well, the first thing to think about is something that you should pretty much think about at every single stage of the draft from this point forward. Is what the enemy is showing vulnerable to anything? Let's assume the enemy blundered by picking Callista on B1. This is something we see fairly often. Individually, Callista is extremely weak to slows, as movement speed slows also slow her attack speed, since they increase the amount of time it takes her to finish her dash from her passive. Thematically, Callista is an engaged champion. She can function in pick comps, but can't really function in disengage or poke comps. As we discussed earlier, engage comps are weak to disengage themed champions, so it's likely the champions the enemy wants to pair with Callista are also weak to disengage champions. An example of a disengaged themed champion that brings slows to the table is Aphelios. I generally call this kind of response a direct answer, as you're picking your ADC into their ADC. This leads to your enemy being unable to directly answer your own pick, since they've already selected their ADC. Unless they somehow flex Callista into another role, but that's pretty unlikely. But what do you do if you don't identify a glaring weakness with the enemy's B1? Let's say it's Maokai and Silas is banned. What then? Now you draft as if you were picking B1. You either want some power pick that's absolutely broken to the point that it warps draft, or something very flexible. One of my favourite R1, R2s in this situation right now is Sejuani plus Azir. These champions are both flex picks, as I think Azir top is extremely strong right now and is very underplayed, 
but they can both function well in any kind of draft, having tools to engage, disengage or make picks, and Azir's strong range allows him to play poke as well. You want to make it as hard for your opponent to respond as possible, just like if you were drafting a flexible B1 pick. From here the draft moves back over to blue side. B2, B3 is actually a bit of a repeat of R1, R2. First, identify if what the enemy drafted has any glaring weaknesses. If so, pick those up now before the enemy covers themselves with the second round of bans. Generally, you'll be able to directly answer at least one pick from the enemy since they've revealed two champions so far and you've only revealed one. If the enemy aren't vulnerable to anything, try to keep yourself as flexible as possible. If you already have a flex pick from your B1, try not to break the flex. Often this is going to mean picking your ADC here, as the champions played in that role tend not to be flex picks, and as I mentioned earlier, ADC is one of the roles least dependent on individual matchups as well, so picking your ADC this early in the draft is often easier than picking other roles. You want to be drafting champions here that have synergy with whatever you picked on B1. This can either be direct synergy, things like Malphite and Yasuo where the synergy is very obvious, or just thematic synergy, just being able to play inside the same themes. If you picked a strong, flexible B1, you should have plenty of options here. The main difference between R1 and R2 is that this is blue side's last chance to pick a champion before the second round of bans begins. For this reason, you're also going to want to identify whether any pool of champions is being clinched. Let's say the enemy has already picked their AD carry on R1 or R2, and they've also banned out Caitlyn and Aphelios. The amount of ADCs left in the pool has been drastically reduced, so if there's one you particularly want, you're going to want to grab it now before the enemy has the chance to ban it away. R3 is one of the most powerful picks in the game. It's very difficult to pick three champions without indicating what theme you're drafting towards, so you'll generally have a good idea of what to draft to counter the enemy. Remember which themes beat which, and identify which theme the three champions your enemy is already showing fit into. If your R1 and R2 picks can play inside the theme the enemy is weak to, amazing! Keep drafting that theme. If not, we're going to want to execute something known as a pivot. A pivot in draft is a change of theme midway through the draft. I'll use this draft as a very simplified example. Here we can see that we have Swain and Poppy. These champions are incredible champions within the disengage theme. The problem we have is that the enemy has three champions fitting a high range theme, Ezreal, Zerath, and Karma. How can we change our draft to try to fix the disadvantage we're at? Range is thematically weak to engage. We need some pick that can help us transform our comp from a disengage comp into an engage one. Let's use Kled for a very easy to understand example. By giving his teammates 100% move speed when moving towards the enemy team using his ultimate, he enables Swain and Poppy to run at the enemy and get on top of their backline squishy range champions. Here we've pivoted from disengage to engage, and can now continue to draft engage tools into their poke comp. It's much, much easier for us to pivot now having only shown two picks than it is for blue side to pivot on B4 having shown three picks already, and having two extra picks banned away from them in the second round of bans. Remember though, keep assessing whether the enemy comp is incredibly weak to a specific answer as well. You don't need to pivot if there's a game-defining champion. Let's use the Sona example from earlier. If we were to draft Sona here instead of Kled, her sustain warps the game in such a way that our low-range disengage picks can ignore the poke from the high-range enemy carries, focus on getting objectives and win the game that way. Good champions to pick for this reason are things that have very, very defined strengths, such as Poppy versus teams heavily reliant on dashes, or Fiora into tanky champions reliant on specific CC abilities. You have a lot of liberty in what you can pick here, as you get two more bands to cover this pick's weaknesses before the enemy has a chance to respond. R4 is probably Red Side's weakest point in the draft. You essentially have to blind something. But by utilising flex picks you can avoid putting yourself into this bad position. You're generally going to want to counter one of the three main individually counterable roles at the end of the draft, those being mid, top and support, as we've already mentioned. So try to leave one of those available all the way till R5. It's extremely important that if you can hold a flex here, you do so, so your opponent still doesn't know what role your champions will be played in. 
you're also going to want to keep bearing in mind the themes of both yourself and your opponent and draft accordingly. Let's take this draft as an example. We've already chosen our mid, ADC, and support roles as red side. The enemy is clearly going for a disengage themed comp, and we're trying to answer it by drafting high range carries. It would be a mistake to blind our top lane champion on R4 here. We want to save the last of our impactful counterable roles until the last pick of the draft, so let's remove that as an option. Our two remaining options are to blind our jungle now, which is not terrible, but the better option is to pick a champion that flexes between our two remaining roles. A great example here is Sejuani. By picking Sejuani here, the enemy has to consider top lane matchups into her. If we had blind picked, say, Viego instead, the enemy could realistically blind whatever top lane they felt like. Flexing on R4 here makes B4 and B5 much harder for the enemy to navigate. One thing to note is that this late in the draft you can often start making predictions about what the enemy wants to pick based on the theme and individual synergies they're already showcasing. You can use these predictions to make more informed choices of what champions to safely blind pick or flex here. I deliberately left the second round of bans until after R4, for the same reason I left the first round of bans until after B1. There's the same dynamic where red side wants to cover their R4 pick by banning out things that are strong against it, like blue side did in the first rotation of bans with their B1. Also like blue side in the first round of bans, you have the liberty to target ban as red side here, since you're the one picking next, so you don't need to focus so hard on immediate denial. As I've previously mentioned, if you have a champion locked in in a role that the enemy is not currently flexing a champion into or has already guaranteed locked in, you can look to ban champions from that role to clinch the champion pool. Obviously, you don't want to be doing the opposite and banning champions from roles that the enemy has already picked, as you'd effectively be wasting your bans. For blue side, it's very reminiscent of red side banning in the first round of bans. You want to try to ban out the best R4 options that red side can opt for, which is much harder than banning out good B1s at the start of the draft for red side, as you'll need to identify what the best R4 picks are within a 30 second time window. Another approach is to preemptively ban out hard counters to something you really want to pick on B4 or B5, and since B4 and B5 are probably the weakest parts of the entire draft process, this approach is definitely not a bad one. If you're already at a thematic advantage, try to think of what possible champions the enemy could use to pivot their draft. If you can't think of anything, look to ban out champions that fit their theme. When there's no great pivots available, it's generally better to commit to the theme you have than drafting a mishmash of different champions. Lastly, as always, try to identify any specific champions that you're extremely vulnerable to. These are often the same kind of champions I mentioned when picking for R3. B4-B5 is probably the weakest section of the draft. You're going to have to blind something every single time. Unless you're extremely creative, there's no way for you to even flex your way out of it, like there is on R4. You do get one direct answer, since the enemy will have already revealed four champions, but even this can often be difficult, as they may have the ability to flex out of it. The one advantage you do have here is that the enemy has revealed all but one of their champions. It should be very easy to identify what theme or themes their comp is playing into. To make the most out of B4 and B5, you need to maximize how hard you capitalize on this. These picks are where you complete your draft, and you need to use them to get yourself a thematic edge, as red side is almost definitely going to get a strong individual counter on R5. Try to opt for champions that don't have very exploitable individual matchups, while either continuing to draft your theme if you're already at a thematic advantage, adding aspects of another theme if you're drafting the same theme as your opponent, or pivoting if you're at a thematic disadvantage. If you're at a thematic disadvantage and cannot find a suitable pivot to put yourself at a thematic advantage, it's time to put it all on the line and try to turn your comp into a pick comp. This will somewhat negate your thematic disadvantage and grant you an additional win condition through snowballing early game hard enough to brute force your way to victory. I don't recommend pick comps in general, but when all seems lost, gambling on a pick comp is better than handshaking a losing draft. Don't feel too bad if you struggle with B4 and B5, these picks are extremely hard to navigate. Finally that brings us to R5, the best pick in the game. On R5 you can see the entirety of your opponent's draft, 
you can see all the individual matchups you're drafting into. It's like cheating. You've hopefully kept a strong individual counter roll until last pick, and you can use this pick to gain a massive point of power on the map. Here's an example from JDG vs Rogue in the quarterfinals of Worlds. The Gwen that JDG pick on R5 here completes their draft perfectly. It has an amazing individual matchup into the Maokai in top lane. It brings magic damage which their team is in need of. It fits the disengage theme they're drafting which counters the engage theme that Rogue have drafted. It has great individual playmaking ability with its ability to tank the Maokai ult, then dodge the follow-up culling with Gwen's W while allowing her team to escape. The pick is pretty much perfect, and that's exactly the kind of thing you're looking for on R5. It can take some time to get used to finding that perfect pick, and it requires a lot of knowledge, but if you can find it, this pick can win the draft harder than any other. There's not much else to say here other than pick the champion that wins you the draft the hardest. Don't settle for mediocrity. In my experience, unless you're already being completely stomped in draft, there is always an incredible R5 pick available. It's important to note that this is not the be-all and end-all of drafting. Creativity plays a huge part in winning draft. There is no objectively correct draft you can opt for. However, the fundamentals I've outlined in this video should give you a great foundation to fall back on and massively improve the consistency of your drafts. Before I finish, I'd like to show you a couple of resources that I use to improve my own drafting. Firstly, pickbangg.web.app allows you to easily plan out drafts in your web browser. This is great for visualising draft concepts you might think of in your head. Also, draftlol.doe.gg is an incredibly designed site that allows you to draft against someone in real time without having to then go and play the game. If you want to practice drafting under time constraints with someone, this site is the perfect place to do it. Links to both of these will be in the description. Thanks for watching my guide. I hope you enjoyed it and learned something new by watching it. If you want to see draft reviews of pro games or general thoughts on drafting in the meta, check out the rest of my content and subscribe to get notified when I upload a new video. If you'd like to try drafting against myself and other people interested in draft theory, hop into my live streams. I'm going to be arranging draft 1 vs 1s between myself, stream guests and members of chat through draftlol.dali. Have a lovely day and don't be one Renekton. See ya!